Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope we all, you all had a good lunch. Didn't eat too much, and uh, we'll keep awake. I think our speakers will keep you awake today. Our first speaker is uh, Bob Weinberg. We're delighted he made it from the airport to here last night. It took him longer to come from the airport here than it came from to, to, than to come from Boston. Uh, Dr. Weinberg is a founding many, member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research and the uh, Daniel K. Ludwig Professor for Cancer Research at MIT. He's also the first director of the Ludwig Cancer Center at MIT. Uh, Bob is, of course, known for his many accomplishments, uh, first describing uh, the RAS oncogene and then the RB tumor suppressor gene. And uh, more recently, he's turned his attention to uh, stem cells and metastases in the interaction of the microenvironment with uh, tumor cells. And we're really delighted, Bob, that you're here. Thank you, Joe, for having me here. How does one change slides? Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm glad I'm not just at a stem cell meeting because if so, it would be very hard to follow up in the wake of Hans Klavers. At least I can put myself under the rubric of cancer and have some self-respect. Uh, uh, my, my laboratory has been focused on trying to understand what really are the determinants of metastasis, what ultimately governs whether or not a, a primary tumor will disseminate and yield metastases, or whether it won't. And this is a field which is still in great flux. We still don't understand any of the fundamental principles. And what I'm showing you now is a, is a grope, groping attempt at trying to figure out what some of the basic uh, governing forces are that determine whether or not cancer cells will or will not metastasize. Uh, part of our thinking is, is <clears throat> formed by the work of Bert Vogelstein, who, together with Ken Kinsler in 1989, first uh, described the fact that as cancers evolved from a benign state to a histopathologically more aggressive state, they accumulate a series of genetic alterations uh, that in aggregate uh, seems to create highly um, malignant cells and indeed is responsible for the malignant phenotype of these cells, one, one thinks. Uh, similar kinds of multi-step histopathological progressions can be found in a variety of other kinds of tumors, although the identities of the responsible genetic elements uh, varies, obviously. About five or six years ago, uh, Bill Hahn, then in my laboratory, attempted to actually recapitulate the transformation of human cells in the Petri dish. In truth, such experiments had been done literally hundreds of times successfully in the context of mouse cells in the laboratory, but until the advent of the telomerase gene indicated up here and including clone, the experiment had never succeeded. But in, in his hands, he was able to define five signaling pathways that when perturbed by a set of introduced genetic elements in concert is able to create a tumorigenic cell from a, non, um, from a normal uh, human cell of various lineages. And here I just point out the fact that this is profoundly different from the situation, as you see in the lower right, of what operates in the context of um, um, murine uh, tumor genesis. In fact, a variety of distinct human cell types could be uh, found to uh, be susceptible to this transformation protocol. Here I give you only uh, one example. And um, this led us to the notion uh, that uh, we could, in fact, recapitulate these early steps of tumor progression, that is at least create an experimental model of primary tumor formation. But importantly, the tumors that were formed as a consequence of perturbing these five pathways rarely, if ever, invaded and metastasized. And that led us to conclude, at least tentatively, that the additional steps that allowed cells to leave a primary tumor and to uh, metastatically disseminate obviously depended on yet other mechanisms that were not addressed by these five uh, pathways and their per perturbation through the introduced genes. Um, with that in mind, we began a series of explorations, some of which came initially from Brian Ellenboss, by coincidence a student of Arnie's here at Princeton, who undertook to transform human mammary epithelial cells, the goal being to create genetically well-defined uh, human breast cancer cells. Because to state the obvious, the breast cancer cells one extracts from a patient are, are genetically ill-defined, at least they have been until now. And in so doing, he was able to create tumors. I show them to you here. Uh, which made us excited uh, because these were the first 
experimentally induced human breast cancers, as far as we know. But then um, we made the mistake, he made the mistake of looking at them under the microscope, only to discover that they were squamous cell carcinomas of the breast, uh, which are so rare as to be essentially irrelevant to human breast cancer pathogenesis. And in response to this, Tan Inche dis described, or uh, undertook to uh, develop a new kind of culture medium in which to propagate normal human mammary epithelial cells from reduction um, mammoplasties. The cells that he de uh, derived thereby, he called BPE cells, in contrast to the HME cells that go through the standard route of, of culturing. And these two cell populations have dramatically different gene expression patterns, and neither can grow in the uh, medium of the other, neither can survive in the medium of the other. Um, interestingly, uh, when they were transformed, uh, one yielded, uh, through the introduction of the identical set of uh, genetic elements, as I've just enumerated, uh, the uh, traditionally cultured cells produced squamous cell carcinomas, whereas the other cells from the same primary culture medium produced adenocarcinomas, indicating something that we all take for granted but has hardly ever been proven directly experimentally, that the differentiation program of the cell of origin is a strong determinant of the ultimate histopathology of the derived tumor. Here I show you Tan Inche's uh, uh, adenocarcinomas of the breast with these ducts. I show you the, the stroma here, which will figure in uh, importantly later. Now, of some interest uh, to our discussion today was the fact that Tan Inche's tumors were metastatic, while those made by Brian Ellenbos were not, even though they had acquired the identical set of introduced genes. Here you see the, uh, the green fluorescent protein labeled metastases in the lungs arising from either subcutaneous or orthotopic sites of implantation. And that led us to a simple, maybe simplistic uh, notion, but one which we think is still viable, and that is that an important determinant of whether or not metastasis ever occurs doesn't operate late, but already is present very early in the normal cell of origin from which a cancer arises, and that the differentiation program of the normal cell of origin is a determinant tilting the playing field for or against um, tumor genesis, um, and that uh, that may only be manifested 20, 30, 40 years later when a clinically detectable tumor will arise. This obviously still needs to be um, <clears throat> fleshed out in greater detail, but it suggests, uh, given the set of identical uh, somatic mutations that these two cell populations underwent, that, these, that the differentiation program of these cells really strongly influenced, ultimately, their ability or inability to metastasize. Of some interest, additionally, is the fact that when one uh, looked for tumor-initiating cells, that is to say cancer stem cells, Tan Inche's um, cells uh, had as few as 10 to 100 of these cells suffice to seed a new tumor in contrast to the million cells that were required uh, for the uh, traditionally produced cells, this being far more in consonance with what one experiences routinely in a cancer research laboratory. Here you see uh, the numbers uh, depicted a little more accessibly. And uh, to this day, we have no idea why these two cell populations with the identical set of introduced genes expressed at comparable levels behave so differently. But in any case, they do. And here, just to review and refresh our memory, I note the fact that we imagine, as uh, Hans Klevers has just mentioned, that most tissues are organized in a hierarchical structure like this, uh, in which self-renewing stem cells ultimately populate a large population of uh, differentiated cells. And um, according to the work of Michael Clark and Mohammed Al-Hajj, that one can, using fax analyses, which I'll return to later, sort out subpopulations of cells, which a small number of which can form a tumor, in contrast to a hundredfold larger population of cells, physically separate from the first, uh, but genetically identical ostensibly, which failed to form a tumor. This being one of the first indications of uh, cancer stem cells, indeed the first one to my knowledge in solid tumors. And so this hierarchical scheme has been transferred as well to uh, the behavior of um, solid tumors. Um, it's still a matter of, of great contention, one must, one must say, but it also um, may be uh, rele relevant to the metastatic behavior that I showed you before. Because if you imagine that each one of these cells is equally competent to leave a primary tumor, you could imagine that these cells, the stem, stem cells, actually, if they should land in a distant site, are qualified to create a macroscopic metastasis by virtue of the fact of their uh, extensive self-renewal capability, whereas the bulk of the cells in the tumor, genetically identical, but lacking self-renewal capability, are not qualified to uh, see the new metastasis, even if they should succeed in surviving the rigors of the voyage to a distant uh, anatomical site. And that might, in turn, uh, relate to the differing metastatic powers of um, 
the two different kinds of experimentally transformed breast cancer cells I described before, uh, these cells may yield many metastases, not because they're intrinsically able to physically disseminate better, but because a far higher percentage of the disseminated cells have self-renewal capability. Conversely, these cells may have low, if any, metastatic ability because they have only a small number of self-renewing stem cells in them. And this remains a speculation which we've not yet addressed uh, directly and, and rigorously. All that said, one has to confront the complexity of the invasion metastasis cascade, uh, which has traditionally scared away a number of many researchers, myself included. I just remind us that it involves uh, localized invasion, entrance into the vessels, translocation to the vessels, escape from vessels, the formation of micrometastases, and ultimately the formation of macroscopic metastases. And this last step is extremely inefficient since half of the women who are initially, 30% of the women who are initially diagnosed with breast cancer have hundreds to thousands of micrometastases in their marrow, but only half of those women actually ever develop metastatic um, uh, tumors, metastatic relapse, indicating that this step is really happens only, fortunately for them, very rarely. And so we can imagine there's actually two determinants of the success of the formation of these macroscopic metastases. The first of these depends on the still poorly defined ability of these cells to adapt to the alien tissue microenvironment in which they happen to have landed. And the second step uh, in this so-called colonization process uh, on the basis of what I just speculated is whether or not these cells, once they have formed a micrometastasis, intrinsically have a self-renewal capability. Again, this is a, a speculation at this stage, but it represents an attempt at least to lay down the outlines, the logical outlines of what must be accomplished in order for a cell to create a macroscopic metastasis. Now, if we go back to the invasion metastasis cascade, including uh, the last step of what's called colonization, we come to realize that it has a biological complexity that rivals that of the previous steps that led initially to the formation of the primary tumor. And that uh, provokes the question of how cancer cells are clever enough to acquire all of these capabilities. And whether if during the acquisition of these capabil capabilities or in order to acquire them, they need to sustain the same number of genetic alterations that were required previously in order to fuel the growth of the primary tumor. Um, and uh, part of the answer to that, I would submit, comes from the looking carefully at uh, tumor cells and the way they behave in their microenvironment. Here are some of Tan Inche's xenografted human breast cancer cells. Here you see that they're stained for the epithelial cell marker uh, uh, cytokeratin, um, which uh, uh, verifies that they're of epithelial origin. Out here, you see the recruited mouse host stromal cells, which are indicated only by their blue nuclei. And the green cells here, of greatest interest, have shut down cytokeratin. We know that they're of human origin because they're stained with a human-specific vimentin stain, indicating they came from the red cells. And indeed, the fact that they're green shows that they've shut down the epithelial marker and instead have acquired the uh, mesenchymal marker, vimentin indicative of the fact that they have undergone a profound differentiation, a differentiation that's often called the epithelial mesenchymal transition, and is accompanied, as I'll indicate shortly, by the acquisition of a variety of other uh, <coughs> phenotypes, which impart to these cells many of the attributes that we ascribe to highly malignant cells. In fact, uh, we, we see that this, these cells tend to be on the outside of these islands of epithelial cells, and that suggests the possibility, which I'll reinforce momentarily, that the induction of the epithelial mesenchymal transition may result in no small part from uh, contextual signals, heterotypic signals, that these cancer cells get from the nearby activated stroma, which induces them to undergo this trans-differentiation step without any kind of genetic alterations. And the topological um, relationship is indicated more clearly here. Here we see a tongue of these epithelial cells in this work by Kimberly Hartwell and Tan Inche. They're stained with this epithelial marker, and they're surrounded by a halo of um, cells of human origin, which no longer express the epithelial marker. But if we go over here, staining for the, the mesenchymal marker, here we see the, the mouse stroma on the left and the right. Here we see the epithelial cancer cells, and here we see that the cancer cells on the outer edge of the tongue of carcinoma cells have turned on vimentin and conversely shut down uh, <coughs> the cytokeratins. And here you can see quite starkly the fact that the microenvironment of the uh, tumor represents a very important determinant of the phenotype of these cells. And indeed, one could even say that one cannot understand uh, this phenotypic change to the extent it's important simply by examining 
the genes and the genotype of the uh, cancer cells um, through, for example, sequencing of their genome. One looks to, needs to look at the physiology of heterotypic signaling in the context of the primary tumor. Now, having said that, I want to give one example, this is the work of Tony Carnoub, of how these heterotypic signals can profoundly influence the behavior of cancer cells. In this case, he was working with human breast cancer cells called MDA, MB231 cells, and uh, he implanted them either on their own or prior to implantation, he admixed a threefold excess of human mesenchymal stem cells. It turns out that human mesenchymal stem cells, or mesenchymal stem cells in general, are recruited in large numbers from the bone marrow to uh, a variety of carcinomas. Uh, on, and once they reach the, uh, the stroma of the carcinomas, they serve still unknown functions. As one could see here, he was interested in what impact the presence of these mesenchymal stem cells would have on the breast cancer cells that had recruited them in the first place. He discovered that the presence of the mesenchymal stem cells, of the admixed cells, had essentially no effect on the ability of these cells to grow into primary tumors. But when he looked at the lungs of the tumor-bearing mice, in mice that bore only the, uh, the breast cancer cells on their own as primary tumors, there were no uh, detectable metastases in the lungs, or at least very few, whereas in the mice in which, the, which bore subcutaneous tumors containing mesenchymal stem cells, there were discernibly large numbers of metastases, about a five or six-fold increase. And therefore, the presence of the mesenchymal stem cells influenced the metastatic dissemination of these breast cancer cells from the site of subcutaneous implantation. All attempts so far to discover whether the mesenchymal stem cells had co-migrated together with the disseminating cancer cells have failed. That doesn't prove that they, haven't, they didn't accompany the cancer cells and s subsequently die, even though we found repeatedly that mesenchymal stem cells, when injected into the lungs, love it there, so they could well survive. And we conclude, albeit tentatively, that the breast cancer cells made the voyage on their own. Uh, perhaps more importantly is the behavior of these cells subsequently. Here you can see a more dramatic demonstration of the uh, metastasis to the lungs in the presence of the admixed uh, mesenchymal uh, stem cells or conversely, an equal number of breast cancer cells without admixed uh, breast cancer cells. There's obviously a very large difference in the number of metastases. Here's a control experiment in, in which instead of admixing mesenchymal stem cells, these human fibroblasts, fibroblasts were admixed, and one sees that there's essentially no uh, enhancement of metastatic dissemination. Now, of some importance is um, the fact that when um, uh, Tony Carnoub extracted these uh, metastatic cells from the lungs and, and purified them uh, and propagated them briefly in um, tissue culture, they failed to show the elevated metastatic uh, tendency of their ancestors that it, it resided within the primary tumor. It appeared, in fact, as if they had uh, forgotten that um, they, the lesson they had learned when they were juxtaposed cheek by jowl in the primary tumor. And um, we believe that they, they uh, went on their own uh, to the uh, site of the, uh, m to the lungs, but once they were present in the lungs, they forgot the lesson that they had learned through uh, their exposure in the context of the primary tumor to the mesenchymal stem cells. And so uh, Tony Carnoub undertook to determine whether he could find any kind of signals that might be exchanged between the breast cancer cells and the mesenchymal stem cells. And in so doing, he discovered that only one cytokine out of about 60 that he screened actually uh, was produced in enhanced amounts when the two cell types, the breast cancer cells and the mesenchymal stem cells, were commingled in culture. And this was uh, one of the uh, um, cytokines called RANTES or CCL5, which is a pr uh, produced in 60-fold higher amounts in the commingled heterogeneous cultures uh, than present by in either of the isolated parental populations. And what he discovered additionally was that if he knocked down um, the CCL5 production in the mesenchymal stem cells, that, in effect, abolished the ability of the mixed cultures to produce this cytokine, indicating that they, not the breast cancer cells, were, in fact, the source of um, this enhanced CCL5 production. And this, uh, together, led him to conclude that perhaps the CCL5 produced by the mesenchymal stem cells might suffice to encourage the breast cancer cells to uh, <coughs> depart from the primary tumor to disseminate. Um, and therefore, he created a CCL5 expression vector which he inserted into the breast cancer cells. And when he did so, he now uh, recreated the effect of admixed mesenchymal stem cells. In other words, he obviated their presence because now the breast cancer cells could make their own CCL5 
and metastasize at high rates, rather than relying on admixed mesenchymal stem cells to impart this uh, uh, metastatic competence. And that's uh, led him, led us to the following uh, model, which is still unproven in, in many of its components. Mesenchymal cells, uh, MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells are recruited from the marrow. When they come in contact with breast cancer cells, a still unknown signal leaves the breast cancer cells and induces the mesenchymal stem cells to produce CCL5. Once this is produced, it impinges on the breast cancer cells and imparts to them, as we already know, increasing motility and invasiveness that allows them, therefore, to disseminate to the lungs. And once they're present in the lungs after a period of time, they forget the lesson they learned through this exposure, and therefore they revert to the low metastatic rate of their ancestors that had never experienced close contact with mesenchymal stem cells. Now, in fact, uh, we don't really understand the connection between the effects of CCL5 and the induction of the EMT program, which I'll describe shortly. I'm showing you this little vignette, if only to indicate that the context, the microenvironmental context of the cancer cell in the, in the primary tumor is an important determinant of its behavior, and that uh, to the extent that cancer cells are changed or adapt to these heterotypic signals, that's not a permanently imprinted change in them, but rather one that they forget once they leave the context of the primary tumor and uh, seed, seed themselves into distant anatomical sites in the body. I want to return, therefore, to the epithelial mesenchymal transition program, the EMT program, because it sheds light on what actually happens to breast cancer cells and others um, when uh, they undergo this process. And here I, I refer to the work of uh, Jing Yang and Sindar Imani, who looked at a series of mouse breast cancer cells that have very similar genotypes but have greatly differing extents of metastatic dissemination. And when they examined these, they found that um, there were four lines, and these three expressed this transcription factor at, at greatly, over, at greatly uh, increased extents compared with a non-metastatic uh, syngenaic line. One can see that here in the terms of protein expression. Here's twist to the three more malignant lines compared with the closely related line that doesn't disseminate at all. And twist, was, in fact, was of, of interest uh, to, to uh, them because it had been expressed, it had been studied previously in the context of Drosophila developmental biology, in which the epithelial cells, of the outer epithelium of, a, uh, <coughs> of an embryo, undergo uh, a process of gastrulation, of ingression, that ultimately allows them to become the primordia of the endoderm and the mesoderm. And in this case, twist seems to be an important factor in enabling this to happen. In order for these pink cells to become green, they have to leave the two-dimensional layer of the um, outer epithelium of the ectoderm, and this entails that they have to go, they must undergo a, um, an epithelial transition. Here you can see the work of Maria Lepton, in which the expression of twist preordains the location of where this ingression, this gastrulation will occur, these cells having undergone an EMT, something that's demonstrated even more um, dramatically in this uh, scanning electron micrograph of a sea urchin embryo by Gary Cher, where here you see the outer epithelium and these cells have undergone an EMT and are clambering up the, um, <coughs> the, the fibers in the blastocele in order once again to form the endoderm and the mesoderm. So uh, Jing Young uh, isolated the uh, mammalian uh, twist gene and dem demonstrated when she expressed it ectopically in these epithelial cells, they lost their cobblestone epithelial appearance and instead undertook, uh, acquired the appearance of mesenchymal cells, much like fibroblasts. And more importantly for our discussion, uh, demonstrated that this transcription factor can act pleiotropically to profoundly reorient the transcription program of a variety of genes. Here one sees uh, the effects it had in shutting down these epithelial, archetypal epithelial markers, ECAD here and alpha catenin, and gamma catenin, and most, but not all of, of Hunt's clavers, beloved beta catenin. And here one sees instead it, the ability of, of twist to induce smooth muscle actin, n cadherin, vimentin, and uh, fibronectin, all of which are archetypal mesenchymal markers. So this transcription factor can act pleiotropically to totally re rearrange the transcription uh, profile the, of, um, of cells, and perhaps it, it also may have a role in the metastatic behavior, which is hardly proven by anything I've told you. In fact, the EMT is known to be able to impart motility and invasiveness and a resistance to apoptosis to cells, but that on its own doesn't prove the importance of this in the observed metastatic competence of the mouse breast cancer cells that express twist at high levels and were the source of its initial identification. 
And so she took these mouse, highly metastatic mouse breast cancer cells and shut it down with an SI RNA and then asked the question about the effects of this shutdown of twist on the b behavior of these cells. In so doing, she discovered that the loss of twist had no effect on the ability of these highly metastatic cells to proliferate uh, in vitro or in vivo, but it did have a profound effect in suppressing their ability to disseminate from a subcutaneous site to the lungs. Here there, you see the large number of surface nodules in the lungs that these cells normally create, and when they're deprived of twist, there seems to be a total disappearance of these metastatic nodules. Uh, in truth, there's still about a 15% uh, uh, residual metastases that are formed after the twist siRNA, siRNA is put into the primary tumor cells, but importantly, all of the metastases that continue to form continue to express twist at high levels, indicating that they derive from the subset of primary tumor cells in which twist had not been successfully shut down in the first place. And on the basis of this, she could conclude that twist is necessary uh, for the um, metastatic ability of these cells, but to this day, we cannot prove that it's sufficient. That is, that ectopically expressing twist in a fully non-metastatic cell confers on them the ability to metastatically disseminate. Uh, one, knowing the powers of twist, some of which I've just enumerated, one could ask the question, how many of the steps of the invasion metastasis cascade could a pleiotropically acting transcription factor actually uh, choreograph, program? And uh, it is my preconception that all of these steps actually are within the purview of twist. However, the last step, I believe, and again, a matter of belief, is not something that a transcription factor like twist um, could uh, actually accomplish. And if this is eventually de demonstrable, um, and one is close to being able to demonstrate this, this obviously enormously simplifies conceptually how invasion metastasis occurs, because it suggests that a small number of centrally acting transcription factors can coordinately affect many of the, uh, or impart to cells, the powers to um, de complete many of these steps in the invasion metastasis cascade. Um, and indeed, uh, the activation of twist may, we don't really know, but may more often than not, not even require a mutation. And therefore, the acquisition of the powers to do so may not acquire additional um, genetic changes in the tumor cells. However, I believe, and again, I underline the word believe, that this last step of colonization, since it um, uh, does not fall within the powers of twist, since it involves the adaptation of disseminated cancer cells to the localized tissue environment, microenvironment which they happen to have landed. And indeed, this subsequent or this late colonization step may actually involve additional um, mutations in the genomes of already disseminated cells, a point of uh, contention that is at present uh, not really addressable in any rigorous way. Another one of these transcription factors, I'll go through several quickly, is one uh, worked on by Kimberly Hartwell. She noted its presence in the Speyman organizer of a Xenopus embryo. Here you can see how potent it is in inducing mesenchymal uh, markers and in shutting down uh, epithelial markers. She was interested in whether it too could program a metastasis. This is just part of her work in which she found that the ectopic expression of guscoid led to a profound increase in the metastatic components of cells. But unfortunately, even this experiment doesn't really prove that guscoid on its own is sufficient to um, impart metastatic uh, components because the control cells which were advertised to be poorly metastatic, already show metastatic nodules on their own, albeit at low levels, and therefore the best one can say about goosecoid is that it can en strongly enhance the already existing uh, basal metastatic rate of these cells. Um, yet another one of these transcription factors uh, was worked on by uh, Piyush Gupta. He took the five pathway transformation protocol and used it for reasons totally obscure to me to try to transform human melanocytes, which exist in the, the basal keratinocyte layer of the, of the skin and which are normally responsible by uh, uh, <coughs> depositing melanin granules to giving, uh, for giving uh, our, our skin its pigmentation. And he transformed these through the uh, five pathway protocol I mentioned before. I just remind us that in general, these kinds of cells, when they're transformed with the identical set of genetic mutations, um, rarely if ever metastasize, but Piyush Gupta's cells ex behave much differently. They went all over the place. As you can see, they went into the lungs where there are hundreds of metastases, the liver, the spleen, and even the mesentery of the intestine. This illustrates in a far more dramatic way the fact that the differentiation program of the normal cell of origin rather than the set of uh, acquired somatic mutations is an important determinant of metastatic ability. And in more detail, uh, Piyush Gupta began to uh, try to explore 
why this was so and discovered that a transcription factor called slug, um, which is normally used by uh, neural crest cells to immigrate from the primitive neural crest and disperse throughout the embryo, is expressed in the thousand-fold higher levels in, for example, uh, <coughs> experimentally transformed melanocytes than it is in these breast cancer cells. And uh, when Piyush Gupta shut down slug expression in the transformed melanocytes, he uh, reduced met metastatic formation by about 93%. This is a nice little vignette because it suggests that the way by which melanocytes acquire metastatic ability is to reawaken, to resurrect a, a transcription factor and a transcriptional program that was normally uh, active in the antecedents of these uh, cells in the early embryo that is uh, enabling their emigration from the neural crest. Um, the final uh, uh, of these transcription factors, I promise you, this is the last one, is, was, ice, was identified by Sender Imani. It's called FOXY2. It's only expressed in the most metastatic of the four mouse breast cancer cell lines with which he and Jing Young initially undertook expression array analysis. Um, and uh, what he discovered is that it has really profound effects in inducing uh, migratory ability, in vitro, invasive ability, 30, 40, 50 fold induction the induction of matrix metallo or the secretion of matrix metalloproteinase 2 and 9, which have been repeatedly implicated in the I mean, invasive behaviors of, of cancer cells, both uh, degrading the extracellular matrix and liberating uh, sequestered uh, mitogens that are attached to the extracellular matrix. And um, interestingly, uh, he undertook a, a um, collaboration with Andrea Richardson of the Brigham Women's Hospital in, in uh, Boston, in which they looked at different kinds of human breast cancers asking which subset of human breast cancers expressed this transcription factor, FOXY2, at high levels in the nuclei? Or was it expressed in all kinds? And they found an associ association with this subset of breast cancers. They're called basaloid carcinomas of the breast. They're only about 15% of breast cancers, but they have a particularly bad prognosis, and they're triple receptor negative. And as he found out, uh, FOXY2 was overexpressed in 44% of these bad tumors, yet, uh, in, the, in their nuclei, yet uh, it's hardly ever expressed in uh, the benign luminal carcinomas, which together constitute about 70% of breast cancers. These are clearly only correlative observations, but given the known powers, the demonstrated powers of FOXY2, one can begin to surmise that indeed it's causally responsible uh, for imparting to these nasty breast cancer cells many of their malignant phenotypes. Uh, FOXY2 is interesting in that it deviates from the other uh, transcription factors in being rather weak in shutting down pre-existing epithelial markers, even though it's extremely potent in turning on mesenchymal markers. And this uh, has led uh, <coughs> Sender Raimani to begin to examine the interactions between these transcription factors. As he found out, his friend FOXY2 is turned on by a whole variety of other EMT-inducing transcription factors, goosecoid, snail, twist, um, as is also slug. Moreover, he's begun to uh, generate, this is a crude version of what's called, I guess, an interactome, in which he demonstrates the fact that these different transcription factors, we think there's six or seven, maybe eight, but not 15, turn each other on. And uh, it, this uh, circuit drawing, uh, diagram is continually being um, <coughs> appended and, and modified, but basically, probably its outlines will survive. And we believe, in a very speculative tone, the different subsets of this circuit diagram of the EMT-inducing transcription factors may be exploited in different types of human cancers in order to enable these cells to acquire um, high-grade malignant properties. Again, this is speculation, but it's already clear from the little we know that none of these uh, transcription factors is ever expressed on its own. There's always a couple others that are co-expressed with it. And so uh, it's possible, but hardly proven, that one will find that this circuit, in, in many of its um, variations, may actually be responsible for the great majority of invasive uh, and malignant carcinomas. Uh, that's, to my mind, a reasonable speculation, but what happens with hematopoietic and, and mesenchymal tumors and neuroectodermal tumors is something we have no insight into whatsoever. Um, that being said, um, Sandor Imani was interested in actually the identity of the cells that are uh, created by the epithelial mesenchymal transition. Now, if you took everything I said until now seriously, which on its own would be a major mistake, um, <laughs> what you would imagine, simplistically, is that when you, when you force epithelial cells through an epithelial mesenchymal transition, EMT, you get fibroblasts. 
it's a, it's a reasonable surmise, and so he looked at the gene expression profile using RT-PCR of human um, normal mammary epithelial cells obtained from reduction mammoplasties and uh, mammary stromal fibroblasts, also from reduction mammoplasties, and he found that they actually had a gene expression pattern that was much different. In other words, they were not the same, and this led him to question whether there was any connection between the product of the EMT and fibroblasts raising the question, to state the obvious, what does it then produce if it doesn't produce uh, fibroblasts? And then he did this experiment two or three years ago, a long time ago, where he and Andrea Richardson used immunohistochemistry to label normal human mammary ducts with an antibody against FOXC2, the fourth of the four transcription factors I just described to you. And when they did that, they discovered that uh, nuclei are labeled here, there, and everywhere occasionally in sort of abluminal or subluminal spaces. And these are positions, maybe, of stem cells. Now, clearly, you, might, you would say to yourself, seeing that, this is an enormous leap of faith, uh, and I would agree. But in any case, this planted the seed of an idea in his mind. Um, and he thought maybe, perhaps on that, that maybe the, the product of the EMT uh, is maybe not a, a mesenchymal cell, but maybe it's a stem cell. And I must say, people in the laboratory began to treat him as if he were a little strange. Um, this was kind of a weird idea. Uh, in my own case, as I often say, I used to think of stem cells over here on the left side of my brain and the EMT on my right side of the brain with no corpus callosum connecting the two halves. They were just totally different kinds of thoughts. Um, but anyhow, uh, he persuaded or cajoled another postdoc in the laboratory, uh, Mai Jing Liao, to uh, look at this for a little bit with him. Uh, he also had doubts about Sender Aimani's sanity, and they started looking at this uh, quietly, and as is often the case in my laboratory, not telling me for months, maybe even years <laughs> afterwards. So the question was, is there any connection between these self-renewing cells, either normal or malignant, and the EMT? That's the, the question they posed. And here, I would uh, remind us once again, they were helped a lot by the work of uh, Michael Clark's laboratory, by Mohammed Al-Hajj, in which uh, they examined uh, the cancer, self renewing cancer stem cells and used this uh, antigenic phenotype, CD44 high, 24 low, to define the cancer stem cells. And so they used this antigenic phenotype both for breast cancer cells and for normal human memory epithelial cells to try to, uh, using fax analysis, to isolate such cells. In the beginnings of these experiments, um, Sendor Aimani uh, applied TGF beta, which in vitro in certain kinds of immortalized mammary epithelial cells can actually induce an EMT, as you can see here. That led not only to the morphological alteration that's associated with an EMT, um, but also uh, to the expression of FOXC2. And when TGF beta was taken away, there was a reversion to the epithelial cobblestone phenotype and the shutdown of FOXC2. This slide, by the way, shows an abiding mystery to us, for us, because all of these EMTs that we can induce almost always take a very long time to uh, appear in vitro, and we really don't understand why. I think it's going to be a very interesting reason, but for now it represents a mystery. In any case, Sender Aimani and Mai Jing Liao began to examine the question of whether exposing epithelial, mammary epithelial cells, immortalized but not transformed, to TGF beta had any effects on their antigenic profile. The bulk of the immortalized mammary epithelial cells that they looked at normally were in the CD44 low, 24 high, part of the fax sort. But when they treated these cells with TGF beta, as I just showed you before, the cells migrated almost quantitatively to the position of putative stem cells. And if I say stem cells uh, in, in, over the next minutes, you can append it by saying putative stem cells. So they moved from here over to there. And instead of doing this, when they ectopically expressed two EMT-inducing transcription factors, either TWIST, which I've described to you before, and SNAIL, which I haven't, they discovered that in both cases, ectopic expression of these EMT-inducing transcription factors f forced these uh, uh, non-stem, these cells to march from the non-stem cell position to the stem cell position. And suddenly, people uh, in my laboratory were no longer uh, questioning uh, his sanity. Um, maybe they asked other things, but they were no longer questioning um, whether he had a head on his shoulders. Um, now, um, they then did uh, what is ultimately, I think, a much more definitive experiment, uh, 
they took this population of immortalized human memory epithelial cells that naturally has a subpopulation in it that migrates in the stem cell position up here, and here's the majority non-stem cell population. And they did RT-PCR analyses to ask for the expression of various genes that are expressed either in the stem cells or the non-stem cells, the putative stem cells and the putative non-stem cells. And here I show you the ratio of expression in the stem cells compared with the non-stem cells. Remember, I'm always, when I say stem cell, I mean putative stem cell and so forth. So the putative stem cells express about one two hundredth as much of the uh, epithelial marker E. cadherin as the um, non-stem cells, which express it at high levels. The putative stem cells, on the other hand, express uh, the following mesenchymal markers, N. cadherin, vimentin, fibronectin, at uh, factors of 100 to 200 fold higher. And the EMT-inducing transcription factors, FOXE2, CYP1, twist, and snail in levels that are between 10 and even 100 fold higher than the non-stem cells. Um, slug, as you can see here, is hardly changed between the two. So this began to add weight to the notion that maybe there was something here. When our uh, colleague and collaborator uh, at the Dana-Farber, uh, Nelly Poliak, looked at normal human memory epithelial cells obtained from reduction mammoplasties, uh, she discovered using SAGE analysis rather than RT-PCR that the putative uh, stem cells expressed n cadherin, a mesenchymal marker, five-fold higher, CYP1, another EMT-inducing transcription factor, 153-fold higher, and FOXE2, the one that Mani found to be interesting, at 14-fold higher. So this was certainly in consonance with what they had found with the cultured cells, or the immortalized cells grown in culture. Some of this work was extended uh, subsequently m uh, by Wenjun Guo, who um, was interested in using mammosphere cultures in order to study the behavior of these cells. Now, I would remind us that mammosphere cultures are three-dimensional cultures um, which, in, in which these cells are, are propagated essentially in, in, in suspension in media containing EGF and basic FGF, and that results in their ability to form these uh, mammospheres. Um, and these mammospheres are themselves quite interesting because you can take mammospheres out of a dish like this, put them in the mammary uh, gland, and they can generate entire mammary, uh, put them in the mammary fat pad, on which occasion they can generate an entire mammary ductal tree. So these uh, mammospheres must themselves contain certain stem cells in them. Their ability to form mammospheres uh, of immortalized uh, um, human mammary epithelial cells was increased by a factor of 60 to 90 through the expression ectopically of snail or twist, as was their prior exposure to TGF-beta, where this inducer was no longer present in the um, mammosphere medium um, in which these mammospheres actually formed. Um, moreover, one could do other variations of this experiment. Jing Young had made a fusion protein, similar to the ER Cree proteins that Hans Klavers talked about before, but here she fused the twist protein to the estrogen receptor, or alternatively, as others did later, the snail protein was fused to the uh, estrogen receptor. And in both cases, these uh, fusion proteins are inactive and uh, sequestered in the cytoplasm. But after addition of tamoxifen, uh, these, cell, these uh, fusion proteins migrate to the nucleus, on which occasion they become active. And here you see that when she activated this fusion protein, it took a year and a day, but eventually um, E. cadherin went down and fibronectin went up. So in principle, these fusion proteins work well. I haven't shown you the similar experiments for snail ER. When um, the uh, mammary epithelial cells were treated in this way with the fusion proteins, then as anticipated, there was a great increase in the proportion, as you can see here in the blue and uh, in the red and yellow bars, of the CD44 high, CD24 putative stem cell population. And when they were treated in monolayer culture, when these cells were treated in monolayer cultures, expressing either snail ER or twist ER, for certain numbers of days, and then taken from the two-dimensional monolayer culture and put into the three-dimensional mammosphere culture in the absence of any tamoxifen and in the absence of any further uh, action of these two transcription factors, then the cells that had expressed twist in monolayer culture formed vastly more mammospheres subsequently. That is, they remembered that two-dimensional uh, culture exposure, where a snail had only a marginal effect on their increased mammosphere forming ability. Still, uh, here was a, a situation where uh, previous historical exposure to twist increased the number of mammosphere stem cells. And when I say that, I, I just mention other interesting work of Wen Jun Go, to my mind. If he tooks, uh, t takes normal mammary epithelial cells in 2D culture, puts them in primary mammosphere culture, about one, one and a half uh, cells per thousand forms a mammosphere. If he takes cells out of these mammospheres, these primary mammospheres, 
disperses them and puts them in the secondary mammoth sphere culture. Now it goes up to 45 cells per thousand. And when he does tertiary, quaternary, pentonary passages, this number is re 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 retained at a relatively constant level. In other words, somehow these mammospheres are smart enough to increase the number of mammosphere-forming stem cells up to a certain level and then control it through some kind of homeostatic mechanism about which we have no idea. And I just mentioned the fact that if one exposes cells reversibly to twist, for example, in 2D culture, and then puts them in mammosphere culture, they remember the previous uh, exposure to the twist ER in the presence of um, uh, tamoxifen. In constants, is what I've just told you, the cells in the putative stem cell position look mesenchymal in monolayer. The stems, pew cells in the putative non-stem cell position form uh, these epithelial islands. The putative stem cells form lots of mammospheres, and the putative stem cells form very few. In fact, it's rather dramatic. It's probably a 30 or 40-fold difference in mammosphere forming ability. So it all kind of fits together, but that doesn't mean any of it's correct. Um, of some interest, I think it is, but still, who knows. Um, if you look at the uh, mammospheres themselves and stain them for either uh, a luminal or a myoepithelial marker, there's at least two kinds of um, epithelial cells in the resulting mammospheres, and this makes stem cellologists very happy because they like to believe that a, a bona fide stem cell should be able to spawn at least two distinct uh, differentiated lineages, which to my mind is a rather arbitrary concept, but in any case, here they are. Um, the same kind of phenomenology applies not to immortalized mammary epithelial cells, but to their derivatives that have been transformed through the introduction of an oncogene, in this case, the, the new or the HER2 oncogene, um, because ectopic expression, uh, reversible expression of either snail or twist, and then putting these cells in mammosphere cultures in the absence of, uh, of further tamoxifen, causes great increases in mammosphere culture, as you can see here, and in soft agar colony formation as well in three dimensions. And in both cases, these, these three-dimensional cultures are conducted in the absence of tamoxifen and therefore in the absence of ongoing snail or twist function. Nellie Poliak, our collaborator across the river, looked at both uh, normal and, and uh, malignant human uh, breast mammary epithelial cells, normal obtained from reduction mammoplasties, and in this case, three or f four different tumors. Um, and she looked at the CD44 high fraction, as separated as described, and the CD44 low fraction. And what she, dis what she discovered was that the CD44 low cells, the putative non-stem cells, express lots of E-cadherin, both normal and malignant, whereas the uh, CD44 high cells express much lower, lower levels of E-cadherin, if any at all. Conversely, if one looks at these mesenchymal markers here, they're obviously expressed uh, preferentially in the cells which have the 44 high, 40, 24 low immunophenotype. And this is, this is applicable both to normal and tumor cells as well. Foxy one she has on this array, and it remains for me an abiding mystery because I don't know why she put it on the array because we have no idea what role it plays in anything. But anyhow, there it is. Um, I'm only showing you to indicate that there are once again strong correlative sources of information to connect stem celledness with um, the uh, acquisition of mesenchymal phenotype. In one final uh, um, series of experiments, um, Sendor Aimani and, and Mai Jing uh, Liao and Wen Jun Go uh, took some transformed uh, human mammary epithelial cells and put into them either twist or snail, and in so doing, they were able to create an almost 200-fold increase in the number of tumor-initiating cells. And one might say, well, this is terrific, but to my mind, this experiment is flawed because the way it needs to be done is to put into these transformed cells a uh, twister snail that can be reversibly activated, turn on twister snail in vitro, and then implant these cells in vivo in the absence of ongoing twister snail function in order to rigorously determine whether uh, a, a, an increased number of tumor initiating cells has been formed. And that hasn't been done yet, so I'm giving you this experiment right here uh, with a grain of salt. For us, the take home lesson. Um, is, it's still a bit tentative, but we conclude that the EMT not only allows cells to physically disseminate, but it solves another important problem that I described before, that the disseminated cells, once they reach a distant tumor, must be able to self-renew. And for better or worse, the EMT seems to impart to uh, these cancer cells a self-renewal ability. Um, and, and this obviously has other ramifications as well. For example, one might take a logical leap and begin to conclude from this that if one were able to isolate the normal stem cells in normal epithelial tissues, not just in the mammary gland, maybe normal stem cells 
have many of the attributes of mesenchymal cells. They're not fibroblasts, but they have many mesenchymal markers. And I leave that as a, an unproven um, speculation, but I think it's a very plausible one now that obviously can be um, subjected to experimental test. In one final uh, thrust here, I'll just talk about work of Sandy McAllister's that also addresses, uh, in an interesting way to my mind, the whole issue of metastasis. For various reasons, she did experiments in which she took two kinds of experimentally transformed human memory epithelial cells. On one side, she took cells that originally had been produced by Brian Ellenboss, and when they're injected into the flank of a mouse, just sit there for six or eight weeks and don't do anything. They're indolent, and she called them responders. On the other flank of the mouth, con uh, mouse, contralaterally, are ton inches, experimentally transformed cells, and they grow quite nicely. They form these uh, myofibroblast-rich desmoplastic stroma, and for reasons that will become apparent shortly, she called these actively growing cells instigators. And the question is, what influence would the vigorously growing instigators have on the weakly growing responders? And so she did a series of experiments. Uh, the responding tumors on their own in the blue triangles would just sit there like bumps on a log for 60 or 70 days and not do anything. However, if they were sitting contralaterally to the vigorously growing instigators, now after about 45 days, they took off and started growing vigorously on their own. And this was not accompanied by metastasis from the vigorously growing cells to the weakly growing cells. There was none of that that could be rigorously excluded. She could do another version of this experiment where she put the vigorously growing instigators on one side of the mouse, let them grow for 30 days, gave, giving them a head start, and then put in the contralaterally responding cells. And now the responders, which on their own would not grow for 60 or 70 days, started growing vigorously after about eight or nine days, as you can see here. Uh, and, and this instigation could already be achieved when the instigating tumor was only about two millimeters in diameter, a relatively small proportion of overall body mass. This begins to plant in one's mind, which I'll hope to uh, solidify shortly, the notion that cancer is a systemic disease long before there is metastatic dissemination. And again, I'll try to develop that momentarily. Not only do the instigators affect the ability of these uh, indolent responders to grow, here they just sit there at the sites of implantation without having any, essentially any net increase in the overall tumor mass, but opposite the instigators, contralateral to the instigators, they now form these myofibroblast uh, rich uh, stroma and they start growing vigorously. So there's at least two effects on the behavior of these otherwise weakly growing tumor cells. In fact, she could demonstrate a series of other alternative instigating tumors, not just the cells of Tan Inche. Here's at least three others. Interestingly enough, these cells here, PC3 cells, which are prostate carcinoma cells, they can grow quite nicely on their own, but they cannot instigate, and they'll become important momentarily. So these grow very nicely, just as the other ones do, but they have no effects in contralateral instigation. So the, the model she put into her head was the following the model we discussed. Maybe what's going on is that the instigating tumors are sending signals to the bone marrow, telling the bone marrow to mobilize cells into the circulation that then become available for recruitment by the responding tumor cells. And that and now enables them to recruit stroma and enables them to start growing vigorously. And if that's true, one could be able to address that experimentally by doing the following ultimately rather weird experiment, taking bone, bone marrow cells from a mouse bearing an instigating tumor pure bone marrow cells, or taking bone marrow cells from a non-instigating tumor that's growing vigorously of the same size, the PC3 cells I just showed you before. Same size primary tumor, same number of bone marrow cells, admixed in both cases to the weakly growing tumor cells, and then examining what the outcome is. And what she found was that the weakly growing tumor cells, when they got bone marrow cells from the uh, mouse bearing an instigating tumor, they started growing vigorously and developed a rich desmoplastic stroma, whereas um, the, the cells, if they, got the, uh, if they got bone marrow cells from mice bearing the non-instigating tumor, they just sat there. In fact, they grew even more poorly than if there had been no uh, um, bone, uh, bone marrow cells admixed. Indeed, the entire um, phenomenology of contralateral instigation could be phenocopied through the admixed bone marrow cells. And in, in this case, she could uh, be sure that there were no um, cancer cells from the instigating tumor that were present in the admixed bone marrow cells to a level of, I think, one in 20,000. So that was checked as well. Um, so this begins to suggest that the instigating tumor is perturbing the overall physiology of, uh, of the mouse uh, in ways that facilitate the recruitment into the marrow of um, 
uh, stromal precursor cells. One version of this, um, which he developed more recently, is to ask the following question. Is it possible that a primary tumor is able to facilitate the growth of distantly located um, derivatives by uh, th this instigation phenomenon? And so she put weakly metastatic uh, breast cancer cells uh, injected into the tail vein, which causes them to accumulate in large numbers in the lungs, and then follow their course in mouse hosts that either did or did not bear subcutaneous instigating tumors. In the first couple days, in both kinds of mice, 95% of the cells were cleared from the lungs. And in the two weeks thereafter, uh, there was an ongoing clearance. But starting at one month and going up to uh, 12 weeks, there began to be a difference. Because the mice which had a subcutaneous instigating tumor, now they began to develop far more um, micro and macro metastases, actually, than the mice which had only a matrix gel control. A and um, here I just mentioned that the effect of the instigating tumor was not on the initial clearance, but ultimately on the ability of the derived metastases to, to, uh, to grow, in this case, in the lungs. Uh, so this begins to suggest that one of the determinants of metastasis is actually um, the uh, ability uh, of a primary tumor to facilitate or foster the growth of its derived met uh, metastases at distant sites through perturbation of the bone marrow. And once again, underscoring the notion that uh, 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 <coughs> tumor genesis is, is a systemic uh, disease long before there is metastatic dissemination. Uh, here's the, the differences in the lungs of these two mice, subcutaneous matrigel or subcutaneous instigating tumor. Um, so this is kind of a laundry list. I, I've given it to you. I'm not going to read it out uh, for you of, of some of the parameters that we believe govern um, whether or not metastasis will successfully take place. Uh, I think this list obviously is subject to much revision, but it at least begins to suggest that one can put in front of one's eyes an outline of what's going on, not a, a, an ac one that's accurate in detail, but one that will, should enable a conceptual structure to be evolved over the next years. And here are some of the people who did this work. Uh, here's Tan Inche, who made the uh, uh, BPLAR cells, Mai Jing Liao, who worked on the uh, stem cells, Piyush Gupta, the transformer melanocytes, Jing Yang on twist, uh, Li Ma recently did some interesting work on um, microRNAs in cancer. Uh, Wen Jun um, Go helped on the mammosphere formation. Um, here's Sender Raimani, whose sanity was uh, questioned by some people and ultimately was vindicated uh, on the stem cell connection. Uh, <coughs> Sandy McAllister, who worked on contralateral instigation, and Kimberly Hartwell, who worked on goosecoid. And thank you again for having me here in this warm climate. <laughs> Questions? My, my, my namesake, Roberta Weinman, has a question. Uh, what is the connection, if any, between the CCL5 receptor or signaling and the presence of these transcription factors like twist and snail? We, we don't know. Uh, one point I tried to make clear is that we don't understand how this CCL5 signaling axis intersects with the EMT uh, program. So I can't answer that, not because I'm trying to be evasive. The answer, we just don't know. Uh, it's something I'm pushing uh, Tony Carnegie to look at. But as you may or may not know, getting postdocs to do anything is not so readily accomplished, at least not in my lab. Anyhow. Uh, Bob. Um, so in MMTV, uh, wind transgenic animal, it has been shown that there is an amplification of uh, memory stem cells. So I'm interested to see, uh, to, to know whether you or others have looked into MMTV transgenic animals that overexpress the, the twist or other EMT factor to see if there's an amplification of memory stem cells. Uh, uh, we have not done that, no. I'll repeat your question. Okay. <laughs> so can, can the instigating effect be due to soluble factors? Can yes. you redo it with conditioned media? Uh, it cannot be done, uh, seen in conditioned media, but we do know that the instigating tumor secretes a factor called osteopontin. Uh, it causes a threefold elevation of osteopontin in the, in the plasma, which is seen also in women with metastatic relapse. Uh, 
and that by blocking their ability to release osteopontin, we block instigation. However, ectopic expression of osteopontin in a non-instigating tumor fails to instigate, indicating to us that osteopontin is necessary but not sufficient to perturb the bone marrow. So there, there are soluble factors which we believe act in an endocrine fashion to elicit this response. You know, there's a, a clinical counterpart, what you were saying, uh, occasionally in renal cell carcinoma, if you take out the primary metastases, uh, decrease in size or disappear. So maybe there's a connection. I, I, I'd be wary of... Uh, occasionally, I said. <laughs> well, I understand. I'd be wary of jumping on that as a vindication of what I've just shown you, but uh, it may one day be connected. Question here. Uh, the, does this work? Not yes. Me. Yeah. Uh, there are also a number of really ancient experiments that may bear on this, namely that in a tumor metastasis model, if one ablated the primary, it also interfered with the metastasis growing. Uh, the original explanation was always immunologic in nature, but it turned out if you simply, uh, you know, destroyed the primary with by purely caustic means, you would get the same phenomenon, and that looks a lot like the instigator story. Y yes, I, I think it has other interesting ramifications. Let me just mention two, and I'll leave quietly. Um, More questions. Okay. One, Sandy McAllister has worked with a lady named Betsy Ripaski at Roswell Park, who's taken very early passage um, colon carcinoma uh, samples, which otherwise don't grow very well at xenografts, put them under the skin of a mouse, and now even though they won't grow for months, they grow, start growing vigorously after about two weeks. And that is potentially exciting because it means one might be able to have xenograph models of certain human tumors if one is able to create a mouse whose systemic environment is hospitable to the taking of these uh, tumors. Um, and so that's an interesting line of work. And I forgot the other point I wanted to make, so let's go to the last. <laughs> the uh, uh, instigator, could you tell whether you had some cells from the primary tumor go to those locations or yes, we whether could. it was an indirect effect? There were never any cells from the primary tumor going. I, I mentioned that several times. It never happened. It's not a, there's no metastasis of the cells from the instigating tumor either to the bone marrow or to the responding tumor. Fair enough? Um, the, I just remembered. <laughs> I'm dangerous. Uh, this instigation is kind of strange, but I rationalize it as being an appropriation of a uh, physiologic mechanism that occurs in the case of massive wounding in the body, where I imagine the wound site sends signals to the bone marrow urging the bone marrow to provide and mobilize uh, mesenchymal precursor cells that can then be recruited into the wound site to facilitate the reconstruction of the damaged tissue. So that's kind of interesting. And so we're trying now to see whether by creating a wound rather than implanting an instigating tumor, we can recapitulate this effective instigation. If we can, it also has implica interesting implications for clinical medicine because it might suggest that many of the operations that are taken, uh, undertaken, for example, to remove primary breast cancers, may actually nullify their own uh, desired endpoint because the post-surgical wound healing response may result in the stimulation of otherwise residual indolent cancer cells that were not removed during the primary tumor um, uh, surgery, a point which makes uh, breast cancer surgeons turn red in the face, if not livid, but can't keep everybody happy. One more question. Yeah, that's, that's related very much to Bernard Fisher's old study where he has dormant cancer cells in the liver and they don't do anything except when you do laparotomies right. on the animals, then they start growing. Yeah, he did that with his own, with his own he and his brother Edmund did that, uh, I think about literally 40 years ago. He, he dug out of his file cabinet some of his old things. And he are, and I are buddies because we graduated from the same high school in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. That was great.